so it's my great pleasure to introduce Simon Smith from Syracuse University. Um, Simon did his undergraduate in um, Imperial College and, uh, in London, and then he went to Oxford to do his PhD with Peter Norman, who we all, we all know. And today he's going to speak uh, about determining the structure of infinite primitive permutation. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, hello. Um, thank you very much, Stalom, for inviting me. And uh, yeah, I'm going to talk um, about determining the structure of, of infinite primitive permutation groups. Um, I'll, I'll start just by uh, making some basic definitions. So some of you might already know what a, what a primitive group is, some of you might not. Um, so I don't want to lose anyone right at the start. Um, then I'll talk a little about some of the properties, and then I'm, then I'm going to uh, mention how, how this sort of research got started. It started with a, a question of, of Peter Neumann and Samson Adelaki. Um, so I'll talk a little about that and some of the issues surrounding that question. It's, um, it's actually quite a, an interesting question. Um, then I'll talk about uh, a few of the results, but then to say anything deeper, I'm going to have to um, talk a little about some graph theory. And um, the graph theory is really the reason that I'm at Syracuse because of uh, Mark Watkins. Um, and uh, in order to say a lot about these graphs, you need to, uh, these groups, you you have to need to, to delve um, quite heavily into graph theory. So I'm going to talk a little about about graphs and rough ends, and then and I'll talk about. Uh, so, throughout this talk, uh, G is always going to be a group of permutations of a set X. So that means it's, it acts faithfully and it permutes them. Um, and a group is, is, is transitive if you can take any element of your set and any, element of the, any other element of that set and you can map that first element to the second element using permutations of G. Now, if you imagine um, fixing a point in that set, and all the permutations that fix that point, so the, the stabilizer of that point, if you look at the orbits of that, they're called the suborbits of, of G. Um, technically, you know, it needs prefix. So if you fix alpha, then it's the alpha suborbit. And um, the, uh, the subdegrees are the cardinalities of these suborbits. So when you have a transitive group, when G is transitive, the, uh, you only need to look at the alpha suborbits and the cardinalities to find all the subgroups, because they're all be the same. Um, so the kind of groups that I'm going to be talking about are going to be subdegree finite. That means when you fix a point, when you look at all the orbits um, of that, of that point-wise stabilizer, they're always going to be finite. Um, I'm also going to be talking about primitive groups, and there's, um, there's a number of equivalent ways of stating what they are, but the, the usual uh, definition is you have your group acting on a set X, and if it's possible to find a proper subset of, of that set that has at least one element in it, just that when you, when you look at its images under permutations in G, it either is stays this fixed, or it is mapped to something disjoint from the original set. Um, so usually uh, we use the word delta. I don't think we use the letter delta. Um, now that, I don't think, gives, gives a true uh, intuitive understanding of, of what it means to be primitive. Like primitivity is, is a very basic thing in finite permutation group theory. Um, so I'm going to use this, uh, this diagram, which I know doesn't look much. But um, to kind of convince you what it is. So imagine this is our set X, and G is is acting on it. It's permuting all of the, the things inside. Now imagine that it's possible to, to partition this set carefully, um, in such a way that all the permutations of that set in G uh, permute things within each part of the partition, or perhaps. In interchange partition. 
But they certainly can't take a partition and move some of it into one and some of it into another. If you can find that, that set, if you can partition it like that, then your group is imprimitive. And you can uh, sort of decompose it in some way. Um, if it's not imprimitive, then it's primitive. So if we think about uh, the finite case, so that's a little easier to picture. So we have a finite set X and a finite group G acting on it. Um, perhaps that group acts transitively, perhaps it doesn't. Um, if it doesn't, then you can restrict its action to each of its orbits, and you get a transitive action. So you decompose your group into a transitive um, a set of transitive components. Then, if it's transitive, perhaps it's primitive, but perhaps it isn't. If it isn't, then you can find this, these um, blocks of imprimitivity, they're called, Look at the restricted action on those, and maybe that's primitive, maybe it isn't. If it isn't, then you can go one step below. You can keep going and going and going, and because you're dealing with a finite set, you'll eventually end up with a primitive action, and a whole series of primitive actions, one for each of these kind of strands that come down. And from that, you can, uh, in some sense, reconstitute the group. So it is a way of decomposing your finite permutation group into uh, primitive components. Now, there's no shutdown down holder term. It's not, it's not necessarily unique, a unique decomposition. Um, but it is a, a, a fundamental decomposition. So, so that's why the primitive groups are so often studied in permutation group theory. The, the, the basic building blocks of, of finite permutation groups. And, and again, in the finite case, we have um, there's a very famous theorem called the Owen and Scott theorem that says essentially that if you have a if you have a finite primitive permutation group, then um, then it's either of a basic type, which means that it's affine, or or it's almost simple, um, or it's some product of them. So where you can you know diagonal action or a, or a reproducting product action or a twisted reproduct. Um, This, together with the classification of finite simple groups, means that we know all, you know, in quotes, we know all <laughs> the finite primitive so groups. What kind of product? Uh, so um, there's a few different kinds, but um, the, a, a, the common one that you're probably familiar with is a, is a wreath product. Okay. So you take one of these basic, if you take an almost simple um, primitive group, and uh, you take its wreath product, say, with a symmetric group, and then you look at its, uh, its, its action in the product action on, um, you know, if your symmetric group is symmetric on n letters, and your almost simple group is acting on a set x, then you would look at the product action of, of that group on Sn with uh, x to the power of n. So that's using to the at the same time. Um, but there's others, there's like the twisted wreath product, and, um, but, it, you know, these are uh, well-known in a sense, and, and so together with the, with the classification of finite simple groups, which, you know, we get to know all that, we end up with a, with a picture of, of um, these, uh, these finite primitive groups. And so we can do things like, say, okay, let's, let's list all the primitive groups that have a degree less than a thousand, things like that. Um, but infinite groups, though, we don't have that luxury. Um, and in fact, we don't even have the luxury of, of uh, this first point either. If you think of your, your, um, your infinite group acting on a set, then maybe it's, you can certainly decompose it into transitive components. But when you keep looking at, at blocks of imprimitivity and the restricted action on that, you don't nece it doesn't necessarily terminate. So, so for permutation groups, you don't necessarily get the decomposition. Um, and uh, also, you, you have a, a second problem, that the, the traditional approach to, to proving this, the uh, common way of looking at the structure of primitive groups, is you, you look for a, a minimal normal subgroup. So that's a normal subgroup that's minimal and non-trivial. Non and then you look at all of the minimal normal subgroups, and you look at the group that they generate, and that's called the SOCL G. And 
the Ones Cot theorem essentially classifies the types of socle and then classifies the types of groups that can sit above the socle. Um, now, in an infinite primitive group, you don't necessarily have a minimal normal socle. And so the socle, you know, is just taken to be the, uh, the identity in that case. So you have these two problems, and that's where um, <coughs> uh, a lot of my research is directed into these groups. So primitive groups that don't, uh, sorry, permutation groups that don't necessarily decompose, and, and also infinite primitive groups. Now, to say something in general is, um, you know, a little, a little too, uh, too much to ask for. So often when people are looking at infinite primitive groups, they look at ones that have some kind of finite property. Um, so uh, yeah, in my case, I'm looking at um, those that have finite subgroups. Now the reason that they are interesting is because when you, if you think of your favorite common torus, um, there's, I'm sure, a probability greater than a half that they will study uh, locally finite combinatorial structures. So graphs, for example, that where the vertices are adjacent to only finitely many other vertices, or relational structures or directed graphs, things like that. Well, if you think about the automorphism group of those structures, they're always going to be subdegree finite. If you fix a point in that structure, you can only map any point adjacent to the original point to finitely many other things. You know, if you do a distance d way and you look, okay, it's a big set, but it's still finite. So, so these groups are, have a have a wider importance outside just just group theory. So, <clears throat> a lot of this uh, comes from um, a question uh, Peter Neumann and Samson and Lakey, and they they asked uh, the following when they were they were looking at, at groups with um, uh, that, that have s certain order preserving properties, but uh, embedded in it is, is this question where they say, take an infinite primitive group that has finite subdegrees and, um, and list those subdegrees in a non decreasing sequence. And then they ask whether the, uh, the so called distance transitive groups, which I'll define in a second, but um, whether they are extremal. Um, and then and then they ask, can we say anything about the group just from the rate of growth? And in the way that the question's framed, they're assuming that the rate of growth is always um, exponential. So this is a sort of diagram that I'll, I'll keep coming back to, but it, you know, this represents the, the possible rates of growth of that sequence. Uh, so they're sort of asking, you know, a distance transitive down that end and everything else. Um, there. So, so the distance transitive um, groups are, are nice and easy to understand. Um, if you have a graph, and you know my graphs, are, they're not going to have loops or multiple edges or anything funky like that. Um, if you have a graph, and um, and its automorphism group has the property that if you pick any two vertices that are at distance d apart, then you can map them to any other two vertices that happen to be distance d apart, as an ordered pair, um, via an automorphism of the graph. And when you can do that, then the graph is, is said to be uh, distance transitive for that distance d. Now, if it's distance transitive for that distance d, but for all d, then we say the graph is distance transitive. Um, so going back to our group that's acting on a set x, our group is distance transitive if, if, there's, a, if there's a graph with vertex set x, uh, upon which g acts distance transitive. Now, fortunately, the, the, uh, the locally finite distance transitive graphs have been, have been fully classified, um, and they have a nice simple structure, so I'll draw them on the board. So they're classified by McPherson and Niemann. Um, and they all look like this. Um, for a given vertex, Every vertex lies in the same number of identical copies of a complete graph. So, and so on. 
and this is infinite. So we can sort of often denote them, um, let's use this notation, but gamma m k n, right? Where this means that every vertex lies in m copies of a complete graph, and the complete graphs are all isomorphic to kn. So they, they have this very, very nice, neat structure. And so we can, because of the way that it looks, we, we can actually work out exactly what the structure of G is when we, when we want to. But we'll come to that um, a little later. So these groups are nice and well known, and the subtree growth rate is very fast. Well, so unfortunately, um, the way that the, the, the kind of question and conjecture is phrased has, has a couple of problems. So um, it sort of implicitly assumes that the growth rate is always exponential, um, and and it assumes that if you take all of the suborbits and you list them in ascending cardinality, and then you list those cardinalities, then you'll end up with all of the subdegrees in the sequence. You don't specifically require it, but if you if you don't have that, then you're throwing away a lot of the information about the group. And um, yeah. I, this, is, uh, this isn't the case, actually. Um, and it isn't the case for a, a really lovely reason. So there's, there's a, a, a beautiful book um, called uh, Junction of Defining Relations in Groups um, by Shansky. And, and in it, uh, he proves a number of, of really quite, quite stunning things, um, largely by creating examples. And um, they're very unusual examples. And one, of, well, one of the first that uh, you come across that is really uh, stunning is that if you take a prime number p, and that prime number is large enough, so greater than 10 to the 75, um, then there's an infinite group in which every non-trivial element has order p. So that means all of the non-trivial proper subgroups are cyclic of prime order. Um, it also means that the group is simple. It's two generated by elements of P or of order P. Um, and it's you know it, it's it's quite a complicated construction, but um, it's it really is very uh, it's lovely. So what that means is if we pick a, a non-trivial proper subgroup, H, and we look at all of its right cosets in, in TP, then, uh, yeah, I'm going to call this group TP, then TP will act on that set by right multiplication. Um, it's going to be faithful because TP is simple. So the kernel of that action is, is going to be trivial. Um, and if you think about that group H, that group H has order of P. Well, all of the subgroup, all, all the proper subgroups uh, that are non-trivial also have order p. So that means it's going to be maximal as well. And as I said in my abstract, if you have a transitive group, and this is transitive, um, in which the pointwise stabilizer is maximal, then, then you have a primitive action. And so the pointwise stabilizer of the, the coset that's equal to h, you know, right multiplied by the identity, is just h. Um, so that's a maximal subgroup. So this is a, this is a primitive action. And what's more, all of its all of its suborbits have have cardinality p. So the subdegree sequence is just going to be p p p p p, and um, it's certainly not exponential. Now, if you take that group and you you look at its wreath product with a symmetric group um, of of any size, but let's just pick uh, two. Then, and you look at its product action on uh, on the set that TP is acting on times uh, times itself, the uh, Cartesian product itself. So the product action, this acting in the product action, then you get um, infinitely many suborbits of cardinality two p, infinitely many of cardinality p squared, infinitely many of cardinality two p squared. So suddenly the subdegree sequence is going to go two p, two p, two p, two p, two p, and so on. But uh, you, you're never going to reach these larger ones. Now, even this isn't necessarily a problem, but there's another way of manufacturing groups that, um, uh, that I call in one of my papers um, the like, M-fold 
uh, graph product, but it's a way of taking these groups and, and embedding them in much larger groups in a, in a way that they still act primitively. Um, and then you can, you can actually get infinitely many um, distinct subdegrees, each of which occurs infinitely often. Um, and so that would mean that just by looking at the subdegree sequence, you wouldn't be able to tell whether it was a really tiny group, like this is a very small group, I mean, it's too generated, or, or one of these massive groups that has a, a, an amalgamated free product in it. Um, so we need to do a, a, li a little with that. Um, so uh, just um, an easy way of dealing with it is to look at the two sequences, two subdegree sequences separately. So pick the smallest ordinal that you can that will allow you to list all of the all of the subdegrees. Um, and we'll call that the subdegree sequence. And then if we stop at omega, uh, then we'll just call that the lower subdegree sequence. So um, you know in, in lots of groups those two things will be the same. Um, but in others uh, they won't. So then what we do is we'll we look at um, at, at how the, the, the subdegree sequence or the lower subdegree sequence grows. Um, so in this case, when we're looking at the lower subdegree sequence, we can talk about it being exponential or sub-exponential. And then we can break the sub-exponential case down into, into sort of polynomial and, and bounded. And from there, start to see whether we can get some of the structure of the group out just from the, the way that uh, the sequence grows. So the sort of the modified diagram of what's happening now is, is that, where I just, just have to extend this all the way down. Um, we'll see whether that's true. Well, the first theorem, and I mean, it's too grand to call it a theorem, but uh, you know, I'll, I'll, we can do the proof now. It's just a couple of lines. Um, is that if you have an infinite subdegree finite, um, a distance transitive group, then, uh, then there's a constant that's greater than or equal to a half, so that, so that it, the, uh, the subdegree sequence grows exponentially, and it grows exponentially like, like c times m1, the r. So, to see this, um, well, we know that the group acts distance transitively on a, on a locally finite graph, and we know that the locally finite distance transitive graphs look like this. So, because it's distance transitive, if I put in another couple of things here, then we see that all of the points at distance one, so that's these, are gonna be able to be mapped to each other by any automorphism that fixes that. So when G fixes this point, because it's acting distance transitively, it has to permute um, this first set transitively. So um, if we fix a point and we let SR be the set of vertices at distance R, then we see that, that MR is going to always equal the cardinality of, of SR. So the, the suborbit uh, the, the sub that has the Rth largest size is always going to be the cardinality of S R. And it's not difficult to see that that that, uh, that this is always going to grow like M and one minus one to the R minus one times N to R minus one. Right? You've got the first case for each each of the complete graphs, we've got M minus one vertices and um, and there's M of them in the first case, but thereafter there's M minus one of them from each point. So it's not uh, it's not too difficult to see, and then you just rearrange things, and you get that um, that the rth root of MR looks like this, and then when you take the limit, um, you get the result. Now the reason that we're using limit and and uh, sometimes later limit sub is because the, the the limit doesn't always exist, even even though in this case um, it's behaving nicely. So we talk about bounds in terms of limits and limit subs. Now, this theorem is, um, is much, much harder to prove. It, there's a, quite a complicated combinatorial argument that's based on one that was given by McPherson in, in his um, uh, classification of distance transitive graphs. Um, 
And it says that if you, if you, don't, if you have a subdegree finite primitive group, um, and it's not distance transitive, then, um, then the, the sequence is bounded like this. Now, the proof uses a, a complicated combinatorial argument to show that, um, that if, you're, uh, if you're not growing uh, as quickly as the distance transitive groups, then you have to have more than one what's called an end, and we'll talk about that later. Um, and then as soon as you're not in that case, you can, you can get this, uh, with, with just a little more effort. But I'm definitely not going to uh, go through the proof. Um, but what we see uh, is this nice, this nice gap appearing. So you have the distance transitive groups going very, very, very quickly, and all the other groups squashed up uh, in quite a large spectrum there. Um, so that means, firstly, that, that, that Peter and Samson and Adelaide were essentially right, right that, that the distance transitive groups do, do grow much faster than everything else, and that there's a gap between how quickly they grow and how quickly everything else grows. Remember that C looks like m minus 1 over m in the distance transitive case. So, so that's interesting. Um, but there's actually a lot more that we can say uh, by continuing to kind of look into the the graph theory. So um, let me. Um, ah, there it is. So on this side, I'll keep that diagram because I might need it. But on this side, I'll just draw some z cross z. There's a graph. Um, so a ray in a graph is a one-way infinite path. So you fix your start vertex, and then, and then it's an infinite path. Uh, I want it to be cycle-free and of infinite length. So you kind of, you know, that, that would be an example of a, of a ray. Um, and we say that the that, that two rays are in the same end, and an end is an equivalence class of, um, of rays. And so this definition is only for the locally finite case. It gets a little more complicated otherwise. Um, two, two rays, they don't have to have the same start point, lie in the same end if, um, if you can draw, draw infinitely many uh, pairwise disjoint paths from a vertex in one, let's call this R1, to a vertex in the other, which we'll call R2. So here we could pick, for example, that, and then here we could pick that, and then here we can go down here. And as long as you can do that, then they're in the same end. So the ends you can think of as sort of points of infinity. If we try this trick here, it's not difficult to see that if you draw any ray, you know, starting from here, say it goes there, and then goes out this way, and then another one that goes somewhere else, you can't do that because all of the paths have to go through um, between this ray and this ray, which have to go through this point here. And because of that, you can't get infinitely many pairwise disjoint ones. So that means that every ray lies in its own end. And so there are, this one has, has uh, uncountably many ends, uh, whereas this one has just one end. And um, so, so that's just a, that's a little bit of graph theory. Now, how does that relate in any way to the groups? Well, if you have a, if you have a, a, a group um, acting on your set X, and you pick any two points, any two elements of X, and you put them in an ordered pair, and then you look at all the images of that ordered pair, you could take that as your directing edge set. Of, of a graph with vertex set x. And so in that way, that if you have any subdegree finite primitive group, you can think of it as, as a group that's acting um, as on, on a directed graph and is actually a subgroup of the, the automorphism group of that graph. So these, these graphs, graphs like this are called, are called orbital graphs, um, because any, any orbit of, a, of an ordered pair 
at any orbit of an ordered pair is called an orbital. And there's a, there's a, a famous characterization of primitivity. Remember, there's the one I gave in the abstract that if it's transitive and it's subgroup and it's point stabilizes maximal, then it's primitive. Well, another one is that whenever alpha and beta are distinct, and you look at the, the orbital graph, you get uh, from taking this orbital as the as the uh, direction edge set. That graph always has to be connected. And conversely, if every orbital graph uh, where the two points chosen are distinct is connected, then, then the new group is primitive. So um, it's easy to see the implication one way. You know, the connected components of an orbital graph will be blocks of imprimitivity. So that's uh, why primitivity implies connectedness. So that means that whenever we're talking about a primitive subdegree finite infinite group, we can think of it as a group of automorphisms of a connected, directed graph. Now, some of you may be used to looking at, at, at Cayley graphs. And, you know, so in the, in, when groups are finitely generated, you look at their Cayley graph, and then it's quite common to study the ends of that Cayley graph. And you can then deduce things about the structure of the group. Well, in this case, in an analogous way, we we know that all of our, our groups are acting on a, on a connected, um, locally finite graph. So we can think about the ends of those and how they relate to the group. Now, I used to call these permutation ends, um, but uh, uh, Rookie Muller and, um, and co and the quote, um, they, they started to use the, the word rough ends, and they came out with a lovely paper that um, generalizes a lot of it, so I've decided Okay, I'm going to start calling them up. So, uh, yeah. So, we could think in the same way that the ends of a group usually refer to the ends of its Cayley graph. Uh, when we say rough ends, we mean the ends of an orbital graph, a connected orbital graph. Now, fortunately, um, the, if you take two orbital graphs, they might not be the same, but they have the same end structure. So. It doesn't really matter which orbital graph you pick as long as it's connected when, uh, when the group's primitive. So, um, using that means that we can now use quite a lot of uh, results from, from infinite graph theory, and we see that an, an infinite primitive subdegree finite um, group is always going to have one rough end, or it's going to have two to the alpha final rough ends. So, um, I mean, that example down there isn't primitive, but, but this one is, so you get to look drawing, drawing one ended primitive um, graphs is, is a little difficult. Uh, so, the distance transitive groups, they always have two theta of null rough ends. Um, and by looking at the rough ends, we can actually uh, get much more structure from the subdegree sequence. So, this theorem um, is really rather nice and kind of encapsulates why bringing the rough ends is, is so useful. If, if we have a primitive subdegree finite um, group and it has more than one rough end, you know, previously all we could say was it's either distance transitive or there's a small gap and it's everything else. But now we can say that if it's not distance transitive and it has more than one rough end, then the subdegree sequence doesn't grow exponentially at all. It actually grows polynomially. So there's a, a huge gap. Um, and, um, and we also, this, this is uh, just an, a, a proof by example, but there's a, there's a group with one rough end um, whose subdegree growth is, is non-polynomial and sub-exponential. So when we look at the, the diagram, that means we still have distance transitive groups kind of lurking around up here, and we know their structure, and they're all nice. Now, there's definitely groups with one rough end in this region, uh, by the last theorem that I put on the slide. And we know that the polynomial has to contain everything else. So that really starts to fragment uh, the spectrum. Now, this, this theorem is really nice because what it means is when you, when you pick a group with uh, the subdegree finite and primitive and it has more than one rough end, um, 
then you can use a lot of graph theory to prove that it, it acts on something that's very much like a tree. You know, you see how there's a kind of tree structure to these distance transfer groups. And as soon as you've done that, you can then bring in Bastet theory of groups acting on trees, and you can get, among a lot of other technical conditions, you can get that, that the group has to have this amalgamated free product structure. And, and one of the conditions is that, is that C, the group that it's being amalgamated over, uh, has to be a maximal proper subgroup of B. So this is uh, really nice. It's not, an, it's not a full characterization. I don't have an if and only if um, statement. Now, I worked for quite a long time on it. I think uh, Ruggie Muller told me he thought about it for a bit. I think a few people have. It, it's really tricky. Uh, we've got... Um, independently pretty close, but it's just this one little case that doesn't seem to work out. So there's, there's definitely an open question here. Is it possible to, um, whenever you have a group that can be expressed in this amalgamated free product structure, is it possible to place conditions on A, B, and C so that we always know that, that the group is primitive? Um, and conversely, that any primitive group has those same conditions? I think the answer is yes. Um, but uh, and I think I could have a reasonable guess of what those conditions are. Um, I just can't prove it. <laughs> so that's, that's a nice um, thing to think about. Um, and uh, this one's a little, a little easier to prove, but um, if you have an infinite primitive permutation group and its subdegrees are bounded above by a finite cardinal, um, then it has precisely one rough end. So, so now the, um, the diagram looks a little like this. Now, the, uh, this case I've just solved. So I have a complete characterization of, um, of primitive subdegree finite groups that have, where the subdegrees are bounded. So I'm going to talk about that at the joint meetings in Boston. Um, so if you're coming to that, then, uh, then look forward to that. Um, we know the structure of the distance transfer groups, we know they have this free product structure. Um, groups with one rough end, who knows. Uh, and, um, and the polynomial case is actually uh, something of a mishmash. The, 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 the growth rates can be very, very close together. Uh, sort of technical proof um, of that. So, the um, the open questions are really um, kind of in this sort of region now. So the first thing um, that I'm absolutely convinced is true uh, is, that, is that the only primitive groups with exponential um, subdegree growth are distance transitive. So what that would mean is when we look at this diagram here, this, this annoying little overlap there could be moved to there. Um, I think that I know what the fastest growth is for a group uh, with one rough end. I think it is if you, if you take a distance transitive group and you take its wreath product with a symmetric group of, of any size, um, that, has, that has very, very fast subdegree growth. It's, it's sub-exponential non-polynomial. I think that's the fastest, but proving that it's the fastest um, <laughs> is really tricky. Uh, so, you know, one approach might be to think, well, if, it's, if something's growing faster, use some combinatorial argument to show that it has to have more than one rough end, um, and then as soon as you have that it has more than one rough end, and there's a contradiction there because it must lie here or it's distance transfer. Um, so that I think that is um, it's true, but and 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 attainable. I'm not sure that it, it should be uh, too difficult. Um, the the other conjecture is more of a sort of a justification conjecture, and that's that this this process will actually work. Um, that by um, by looking at this growth rate and kind of breaking it down and zooming in, that you can actually extract structure theorems. Now it, it certainly looks to be the case. Um, you know, like I said, I have a, a structure theorem here. All the groups that sit here are um, almost simple, or they are, have a have a wreath product structure, or they're a split extension. Um, 
and like I said, that's what I'm going to be talking about in the joint math meetings. Um, you know, if it's fast enough, then also we know it's structure. It's a clear structure. Um, so certainly I think it's the case that here we should also be able to do the same. Um, for polynomial growth, maybe not. Um, so it's a kind of caveat to its conjecture. Um, and so the big questions are, are, you know, what about the sub-exponential case and what about the polynomial case? Um, they are really where I'm, I'm at at the moment. Um, so, so yeah, if you're, if you're interested, then um, uh, most of this stuff is in is in a paper that I um, that was published last year. Um, most of the stuff about the bounded subdegrees is going to be coming out because I did it during my postdoc, so it's going to be coming out over the next. Well, I haven't submitted any of them yet, um, and I'm still writing the second one, so they'll start coming out over a period of time. But uh, yeah, there's there's more open questions in in there. Um, so take a look, I think it's open access. And, and so yeah, thank you very much for listening.